So this webinar is now being recorded. Phones are muted. So we have about a minute to go. We'll, we'll give everyone uh, uh, some time to start to join in. Hello, everyone. I can see that um, our attendees are starting to join. Thank you for joining us. Um, our panelists are here with us, but uh, we'll give it a minute or so for other people to join and then we can start. So it's 8.59 still. Um, let's, uh, let's give it a couple of minutes for people to join, then we can start. All right, it's, uh, it's 9.02, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, I see that panel, uh, uh, attendees are continuing to join, but we'll just uh, get started in the interest of time. Uh, my name is Swati Chaturvedi, and I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of PropelX. Uh, today, we're going to have a panel discussion on the impact of the election on venture capital and startup activity. Uh, and our topic is, where will you invest after November 3rd? Uh, we have a great set of panelists, uh, Ronjan Nag, who is the founder of the R42 Group. He's a serial investor, entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and angel. Ronjan also heads up the MIT Angels Group here in California. Jamie McGurk, he is the managing partner at Cochu Management, um, which is a large investment management firm with about $25 billion in the management. Uh, Jamie leads their venture uh, efforts. And then we have Ben Schrag, who's the Senior Program Director at the National Science Foundation, America's Seed Fund. So we have a great set of panelists. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, as we get started, I just want to uh, share that this presentation is solely for informational purposes. This is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. So just setting the context here. Uh, the US business confidence sank in April 2020 once COVID hit us. But today it is higher than about the same time in 2019. So as you can see, this is 2020 April, and then it goes forward. But if you look at the same time going back to 2019, this is where we were. And 
uh, you know, the red line is the United States, the black line is the OECD. So, so we are at about, you know, uh, we're in, in, in September last year, we would have been about here. Uh, and this is where we are at today. So we're higher than where we were last year. Um, moving on, but at the same time, consumer confidence has cratered. It is much below where we were at a year back. So businesses and consumers are looking and thinking differently uh, today. So uh, the pitch book National Venture Capital Association Venture Monitor uh, had put out their Q3 2020 uh, issue, and they did summarize the potential impact of the election. I have taken an excerpt from the NVCA Venture Monitor right here, uh, and this is part of their policy highlights. Um, and some part of it is what they say is that President Trump and Vice President Biden have dramatically different visions for the country, uh, while on the one hand, uh, Vice President Biden has an ambitious program uh, to invest in uh, things that address climate change, um, you know, invest in infrastructure, basic re research, education, and healthcare. And in order to finance these, he intends to raise taxes. Um, and specific examples uh, that, that do matter are corporate tax rate would go up to 28% from the 20 or so percent that it is today. And on the other hand, uh, you know, a, a re-election of President Trump uh, means that they would follow or double down on their existing policies, uh, which were, you know, significant decoupling from China, uh, enhanced foreign investment scrutiny, stricter Im immigration policies, and, and continued deregulation. So these are real policy differences, and uh, our goals today are to just understand and discuss the impact of some of these. So let's take a quick look at where we are at today and in terms of numbers uh, and who stands to gain because these are two different policy visions. Um, so consumer surveys point to currently an 11 point advantage for Vice President Biden. So as you can see, this is uh, the line for Vice President Biden, this is the line for President Trump. And the question is, who do you intend to vote for? Uh, this survey has been taken by MB Mobile. So as you can see, Vice President Biden is leading uh, just a little bit. Um, but it's also useful to look at betting odds, which is where people put their money. Uh, and betting odds have shortened and then lengthened, and then now they seem to be shortening again. Uh, but where we are at today is that uh, Biden is the favorite and Trump is the underdog in, in betting terms. Uh, so that's where we are, big advantage for Vice President Biden. However, these odds have been very wrong in the past. Um, and in November 2016, this is where uh, Miss Hillary Clinton was, and this is where um, President Trump was. So there was, she had an 88% uh, advantage and Trump had a 13% um, interest. So she was the the, uh, you know, she was the favored candidate by far, and we know how that turned up. So it's very difficult um, to actually trust any of these numbers anymore. And so we do have a, a situation where it's two different policy visions, and our goal is to understand how these could impact. At, at this point, you know, the only survey that counts is the actual um, vote, and until that is done, uh, we do have these different uh, policy visions and we're trying to understand what is the impact of these. So without more ado, uh, you know, these, these are some of the points for discussion. I do want to introduce um, our panelists uh, and I have just given quick overviews of the panelists, but I'd love for them to introduce themselves as well. Uh, so Jamie, do you, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Make sure um, so I'm uh, I'm Jamie McGurk. Um, uh, I'm managing partner of the private investment business at Co2, uh, which spans both venture stage, early seed, Series A, all the way through. Um, uh, we have a growth fund uh, that uh, uh, invests in growth, and so and then we have a public markets business that picks up there. So we invest in anything private, uh, anything public, all in tech. So we we focus on particular sectors, enterprise consumer fintech. Um, and so we kind of span span the life cycle. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Ranjan, do you want to introduce yourself? 
Sure, yes. Uh, my background is in uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, I've been an inventor and entrepreneur, built the first speech recognition telephones, um, sold my first company to Motorola, my second company to BlackBerry, uh, and the third company was more the investor and the advisor to Apple. Uh, so that's my reputation, starting companies and selling them to phone companies. Uh, for the last few years, I've been a fellow at Stanford teaching an AI class. And uh, I have a venture fund, the R42 Group Fund. Uh, we have about 60 positions. Uh, we have one company going public today, Squeeze Biotech. Congratulations. Um, and then we have uh, the R42 Institute, where we uh, invent and inform and have projects and uh, people who want to be R42 fellows can uh, apply to that program and that's free. Thank you, Ranjan. Ben, would you like to please introduce yourself and your role at the NSF? Sure, thank you. Yes, my name is Ben Schreik. Um, I'm uh, one of the program directors and I'm also the, the policy liaison for the small business programs at the National Science Foundation. Uh, you probably uh, have heard of the, the acronym SBIR, which stands for Small Business Innovation Research. So that's the, the version of that program that exists at the NSF. Uh, there's other, other versions of that program across the federal government. Um, Prior to NSF, uh, I was actually at a semiconductor diagnostic startup. Um, at NSF, my role is to be one of the program directors who are awarding non-dilutive funding to pre-seed and seed stage deep technology startups, uh, basically across the, the country. Uh, so we're obviously focused on United States-based companies, but focused um, beyond that very broadly on a range of markets and a range of technology areas, trying to actually capture any technology area where there is really a, the potential for a deep technology to disrupt and create uh, economic opportunities. Thank you, Ben. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get started with our questions. And uh, just a quick note to our audience, there is a Q&A chat box uh, at the bottom right, uh, well, bottom somewhere, depending on where you place your panel. Um, and so please do share your questions. We will leave aside some time at the end of the panel uh, to take your audience questions. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'd love to understand um, what, if any, is the impact of the election on venture and startup activity. So, uh, Jamie, because, uh, you know, Coach, you does have a hedge fund also and invests in public equities. Uh, so maybe you could get us started on, do you think there's an impact uh, on venture and startup activity? So I guess it depends. Um, you know, the uh, first, it, it, I think it depends on the outcome. Um, and so, you know, I think I think right now we're living in a world of uncertainty, mm -hmm. and I think the uncertainty actually has a bigger impact than the result. So um, uh, I think it does. It, it's it's uh, when you're looking at venture. So when you're looking at the early stage as opposed to growth, um, venture tends to take a ten year view when you're making investments. So. Yeah. It's, you know, it's very certain that if you're making a venture investment today, that there's going to be a different administration in office when you're kind of mm -hmm. coming on the realizing the, that investment. Um, and so I, I think it's a very long term uh, bet that you're making. Having said that, uh, it will impact how you think about investments, how you value investments, how companies themselves think about spending, how they're hiring, um, depending on what the business climate is like. The willingness of of, uh, of employees to join a startup. Um, so there's lots of different uh, factors that go into the exact impact. But I would say, in terms of planning and making investments, these are very long term um, betting on long term trends, and they're not necessarily impacted day to day, year to year, even administration to administration. Hmm. Interesting, Ranjan. Do you think there is an impact of the election itself? Uh, tactically, obviously, there's a change of administration. I think the higher order bit when we're investing is that we're not really looking at um, taxes and things like that. Uh, but I agree with Jamie. It's really, no, are you betting on the right macro uh, trend for a company? Now, what's the macro trend in the next five to 10 years? And what's the climate? So are there going to be any customers for the technology you're building? Uh, and are there going to be any co-investors for the technology you're building? So there's definitely dynamics of, uh, you know, I think, I, I think Ben probably talked about this. There's certainly government, to, government grants and things like that that uh, 
you know, seed our high risk uh, events. So if there's less of that, you know, those budgets are cut, then uh, that will be um, a, an issue. Uh, there is the issue of, uh, to, to the extent that taxes come about, now we, there's a general increase in taxes, but I suspect uh, one of the things that helps startups, and it's in the early stage startups, is the QSBS tax treatment, which allows you uh, tax-free capital gains after five years. Uh, I reckon that probably will be kept. You know, I know nothing, of course, but that's a kind of a, a popular kind of uh, 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 system. And you could argue it pays for itself because the companies, by definition, if they actually become successful, they start to pay taxes. And so there, there, there might be a, a, a match there. And also it's longer term, it won't actually, even if you removed it, it won't really affect um, the investments being made now the, 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 the later. So those are a few comments. Got it. So Ben, we come to you. What our investor panelists are saying that on the one hand, they take the long view, which is that it doesn't matter. But on the other hand, you know, some of the policies do matter. Uh, what's your, your view uh, and, and where do you stand on startup activity? I mean, definitely Ranjun mentioned the amount of funding, etc. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, I, I agree with Jamie and Ranjan. I think a lot of that resonates with um, what we've seen through prior um, changes of administration. I think since uh, we typically invest probably earlier than, you know, actual private investors, I think that the further away you get from the exit or the, the, the earlier in the, the life cycle of the company, I think the less the less kind of relevant the macro macro stuff tends to be, as, as Jamie mentioned, you know, the more you get towards growth rounds, the more I think that macro uh, trans matter. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, since we're really usually touching these companies within the first 12 months of their existence, um, I think um, those effects have are spread out over such a, a long timeline that uh, they don't have as much effect uh, in that sense. The other thing I would say is that I think all of us do touch a certain kind of company. So the deep technology startups where um, more oftentimes it's the hammer you're given, not the nail, right? You're starting with uh, technology and sometimes you have to find the problem, which is not necessarily how a lot of entrepreneurs do it. When you have that kind of company, I think that those type of entrepreneurs tend to also be less focused on macro trends. The hammer comes from the scientific lab or whatever, and whether the macro trends are good or bad, they want to figure out what the nail is. And so I think for that kind of company, I, I sense that they're slightly less um, they, they, they move to the winds of the macro environment and the political environment slightly less than maybe more traditional companies that are not deep technology based. Understood. So what we're agreeing on is that for startups, because they're so early, so the macro trend doesn't matter as much. There's one thing that Jamie said, which I thought was relevant, is the business sentiment, right? And the willingness of, of uh, people to join the company. Uh, do you want to expand on that? I mean, I feel like if there is a negative sentiment, today there is a very positive sentiment business-wise, we just saw that. Um, so do you wanna expand on that, Jamie? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the lifeblood of early stage companies is employees. And so, um, you know, if there's an unwillingness to, in a, in a recessionary period or, or when business sentiment is low, as you rightly mentioned, we're not in that period. Um, I think the sentiment goes kind of sector by sector too, but we can we can get into that later if you if you want. Um, but I, I think it's uh, when that's low, it's uh, less likely for employees to are, that are willing to take a risk. Not all, but some. It's unlikely that um, companies are overfunded uh, and therefore you know willing to spend um, uh, on employees and other things. Um, unlikely that, uh, that they'll be funded for shorter periods of time. So a lot of times, you know, the calculus when you're doing a series A is, okay, what are the milestones to get to a series B uh, from C to A, et cetera. And so a lot of the calculus that goes into what those milestones are and the likelihood of being funded, those uh, timelines elongate. And so there tends to be some more conservatism around, um, you know, the likelihood and the probability of being able to successfully raise, uh, you know, a, a next round of capital, and so all of those, I think, are are um, are meaningful factors, and obviously, all of those are inside of a company. But to your original question, I think the employee thing is a key one, where um, you know, it'll it'll just it'll just have have more of a uh, a rounding effect on growth. Right. Uh, 
So do we think though that, um, so we know what the, the sentiment is under President Trump. Uh, do we think that the sentiment is going to turn if there was a, a Biden administration? Ranjan, Ben, do you have? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think I suspect uh, under Biden, we'll see, you know, what the actual implementations are, but I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure to be uh, balanced and unifying. And so there is, you know, I, I know there's probably Republicans are kind of worried that uh, it'll go hard left. Um, but my expectation, because we see, you know, on the votes on the, on the you know, it's not like 80% on one party and 20% on the other. It's like a 50-50 kind of thing so at, the, at the margin. And so I think there's going to be a lot of pressure, specifically with the Supreme Court uh, and the like, where on the one hand, uh, you know, one party owns it, will probably own the Congress, Senate is up for grabs, uh, Supreme Court's on one side. Uh, there's going to be, I think, a power play. So if any one entity tries to overplay their hand, uh, I think uh, the other side would actually, uh, would actually uh, um, uh, 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 revolt and, and, and do that. Each party's got their own, own, own chess pieces. Uh, so, so I think that, um, uh, that uh, under, under a Biden administration, there'll be more plays on things that have been deprioritized under the Trump administration. So environmental technologies, those kinds of things mm -hmm. uh, would give, be given more um, uh, sort of limelight. Uh, I, I think startups should be given some favorable light. I mean, I think both parties want, want, want startups. The little guy, the little guys have no money. Republicans like it because, you know, it's sort of, uh, it, it's capitalism, it's growing into, uh, the, the Democrats like it it's because it's the little guy, the small businesses. And so both, both, both have reasons to support this startup community. So we may be relatively sheltered at the startup level, at least. Got it. Ben, uh, do you have an opinion? I know, well, you work for the company. Yeah, I'm not going to speculate on the, <laughs> the specific effects of the, the winner of the election. Um, but uh, I, I will say that um, I've been at NSF for about 11 years and um, just looking backward, you know, you can, everyone knows kind of the, the administrations and the political wins for the last decades. And I will say that, you know, to take an example of climate tech, um, you could kind of try to predict that based on Congress and, and the president. But what we have seen just, you know, as far as our companies in the portfolio who are in that sector and their ability to raise has just been a, a linear increase in the amount of funding available and the opportunities for them over the last decade, right? So that suggests that it's really more about um, something that's happening, uh, that that funding is available more because something is happening outside of a political system, um, you know, and specifically in, in the really driven by the venture community and, and honestly, like even more just larger trends, I think, uh, in the world. What are those? Well, I mean, certainly the um, there's a lot more funds that are explicitly in their investment thesis talking about um, either you know yeah. mission mission impact uh, and specifically talking about climate. You know, there's yeah. there's firms entire not just funds but entire firms who are built on kind of double bottom lines. Um, yeah. I don't think there's a whole lot of that. I mean, there was some philanthropic foundations, but there's actually you know real um, hardcore. Uh, investors, VCs who are building what looks like a normal fund, but they have this uh, focus areas now. Yeah. And so I think uh, when we would fund, you know, funding a company that's trying to get rid of styrofoam, for example, which is one of the very common materials problems in the environment, those companies, uh, those companies had a lot of trouble. I mean, they still, it's still a hard company to build, but the funding is much more available for that kind of company uh, than it was about 10 years ago. Got it, got it. So let's move to the next big topic. What are the impacts of specific policies? So uh, I think, Ronjan, you, uh, you already touched on uh, some of these things. But if you recall what I had highlighted um, in the NBCA uh, Venture Monitor uh, piece, they, they discussed tax policy, global trade. I mean, I picked out these um, because I think they're relevant to us, tax policy for global trade and funding for fundamental research. So um, I do want to have a quick chat about these. So taxes, you know, both of you already mentioned that, Jamie and Ronjan, that you don't think it would impact a startup. I personally feel startups don't make any money here anyway. So I'm not <laughs> sure <laughs> that the tax policy actually impacts, uh, impacts startup activity, but I'd love to hear your views on that. 
Well, I, th I think the corporation tax, corporate tax, I don't have no, but like you say, they don't make any money anyway. So, yeah. uh, uh, but it, I think at the margin, people, the, you know, the interest rates are so low right now. Um, people uh, you know, are sort of looking for avenues to put uh, funds in and uh, uh, certainly personal tax rates uh, Yes, may be high or even are, are high, uh, debatably. Um, and so, uh, if, if it's uh, no matter what administration comes into power, they're going to have to lock, going to have to spend a lot regardless. And so, the, the sort of trend may be for taxes to go up at the personal level. And so, you know, the, the QSDS thing, for example, is going to start looking more attractive. And people say, and that basically encourages people maybe. To switch from the stock market where they can liquidate in a year or six months and they're paying high taxes um, to maybe illiquid uh, startups it's, it's a motivation that that might actually uh, encourage them to um, so so ronjan the qsbs is one thing but part of the biden administration's proposal is a parity between uh, capital gain so yeah. this has been a, a topic of discussion for venture capital for a long time uh, but anyone who makes LPs that make a million or more, you know, they're going to have to pay income tax. Uh, do you think that impacts venture activity? And Jamie, also, do you think that impacts venture activity, venture fundraising, certainly? I think the, the taxes are the taxes. You got to live with it. And um, I, I sometimes say I enjoy paying taxes. <laughs> okay. It's the price of civilization, right? You, know, you, can, you can live in another country where they don't have any taxes. And uh, if I'm paying taxes, it means I'm doing well. And if I'm not paying taxes, <laughs> it's a bad year. So uh, the, the higher order bit is if it's high taxes, low tax, it doesn't really matter. Does, it, does the pie get bigger, right? And so this, that's obviously what the politicians have to try and figure out. Uh, that is, you know, is the taxes paying for infrastructure and yeah. a civilized society? And, uh, Jamie, what's your view on this? I, I I generally agree. I think you know taxes rarely impact um, the you know investment decision making, especially for long long lived um, illiquid investments. You know, I, I think one thing that hasn't been touched on is a non insignificant portion of LPs and institutional venture funds are endowments and foundations that are shielded from 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 taxable gains. So. Um, and when I say non insignificant, it's not small. So it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, you know, very large, actually. So, um, you know, I think that that certainly is an impact, I think, um, you know, more importantly, the investors and the general partners at funds, how that will impact, you know, if, if carry if capital gains are then uh, switched to income tax yes. and it's been debated for a long time. Um, and for some reason, the focus has always been on private equity versus venture capital. And I don't know if there's a distinction to make between the two and if they'd be treated differently. Um, and obviously there's a size difference between the two. That's probably why the focus has been on private equity. But I think that, you know, that if anything could have the largest impact, but um, to Ron John's point too, about in a low interest rate environment and, you know, a lot of these institutional investors, you know, all of these institutional investors by definition are investing somewhere. So, um, you know, it's, it's then it's making a bet towards different asset classes. And, it, you know, right now, as we sit, it doesn't appear that there would be tax advantage in one asset class versus, versus the other, maybe save real estate. But um, so I, I, I don't think it's going to have a, a major impact. Yeah, and also the whole GP thing, right? I, I do feel that it's a choice of profession. People are not going to change their profession just because uh, the tax rate increases. I mean, it's, it's more money in hand if the tax rate is lower. Would you agree? That's, yeah. So, yeah, right? I, I don't anticipate that people who were formerly GPs now decide to become employees of some <laughs> large corporate, right? Completely fair. <laughs> okay, so um, Ben, I do want to get your feedback on this funding for fundamental research question, right? Um, what we've seen is uh, during uh, President Trump's tenure, there were several proposals to cut the funding for the SBIR programs. Uh, what we also saw was the Congress overrode those. So those actually did not materialize. In your view, uh, would the election have an impact on funding for fundamental research, uh, funding for the SBIR programs and so on? Um, yeah, so again, I, I, um, 
I will not pro prognosticate as to what's going to happen going forward, but I, but I will say that, um, you know, being part of the National Science Foundation, where most of the funding that our agency gets is for uh, blue sky basic research, um, you know, that's, that's basically the source of one of the most important kinds of feedstock for the kinds of companies that we support. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes, um, you know, maybe a different agency, but, you know, collectively federal, federal research funding is something like 150 billion. And, um, and almost all of our companies have in the last decade, some, some federal funding that led to, you know, some of the technology or all the technology that the company was built around. Now, the same caveat that I think Jamie and I mentioned earlier applies where hypothetically, if federal research funding was to be cut, I think there would be a, a that would be a leading indicator of decli a decline in startup activity for deep tech startups. It might yes. take a while. Mm -hmm. You know, typically what we see is the, you know, um, the, the, the gap between the fundamental research award and the company foundation is between, could be, it could be two years, could be 10 years. Um, so even if you have a, a significant cut, um, you know, you would expect that there would be a the startup foundation, the startup formation would be smeared out kind of over the, the ensuing decade. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say, thanks. Yeah, no, I would agree. I, 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 when those proposals were made, I will say that we got really worried because as you know, our target companies are companies that have been at the NSF like three years prior, or granted the award, NSF awards three years prior. So we did get worried and we were happy to see that, uh, you know, the funding for research was not impacted, so. Uh, I, that's, that's... Yeah, I, I am tempting fate by saying this, but I'm, I would say that we're very lucky to have the, you know, the NSF has a congressionally appropriated budget. The SBR program is a congressionally mandated percentage of that. So there's these two levers that both are controlled by Congress. Both of those levers have never actually decreased year that's to year, to um, except for the stimulus funding in, in 2009, where there was obviously a, a one-year bump. The kind of the, the standard funding um, amounts have been flat sometimes, but they've never actually, um, I don't think they've actually gone down at all uh, from year to year. And NSF has been around since 1950. So mm -hmm. I'm going to knock on my desk <laughs> and, uh, and uh, hope for the best. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then there is this question of global trade. So, uh, Jamie, could you share your views on whether or not that has impacted your activity or your portfolio company's activities? In any way? Um, it, it's, I would say it has. I mean, there's been some impact. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's, um, you know, top of the list of things that, that, that we're thinking about, and especially when we're thinking about early stage, mm. the, the focus of my comments here. I mean, I... I think where it has an impact when you think about either global trade or just kind of the macro view of politics and um, and one thing that we didn't touch on, and I know there was a question in the chat about this, um, and I talked about uh, employees before, but immigration. So I think, you know, the immigration certainly has, when I said employees are the lifeblood of Silicon Valley, um, you know, that includes in large part um, employees that are immigrating to the United States to work at these companies and found these companies. And so... I think that absolutely has an impact. Um, if you look back over the course of the last 10 years, there was a very large influx of investment uh, internationally into Silicon Valley, and I would say especially from China. Yes. Um, and right now, when I think about impact of global trade, um, you know, front and center of that is kind of US-China relations and, and trade agreements. And then there's a whole myriad of others, whether it's Brexit, whether it's you know, NAFTA or, or the like. And so you know, there's lots of different complex issues in all of those, but I think the biggest impact on Silicon Valley is probably um, uh, relationships uh, with China. And you're seeing a little bit around the edges and how that impacts like, the, the biggest IPO uh, ever is uh, about to happen uh, imminently with Ant Financial. Um, and I have to imagine that if this were to happen five years ago, that it would be listing on the New York Stock Exchange or the yeah. NASDAQ. And it's, you know, it's going public, you know, share split between um, uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong. Mm. And so uh, that is, you know, certainly a very visible impact um, without any talking about any companies in particular. Um, I think and, and do you think it's a loss uh, for, uh, for, for the U.S.? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's frankly a loss both ways. Yeah. Um, I think it's a loss both ways. But I think, yeah, when it, it's definitely a loss for the U.S. Um, so whether that's employees, whether that's investment, whether that's things like an IPO and a U.S. exchange, it, I think it, it does absolutely have an impact. 
And so, Ronjan, do you think the pie is getting or shrinking as a result of this uh, global trade disagreements? Or mm. well, now at the startup level, uh, you know, you've got a couple of dynamics. Um, uh, I, I think you mentioned the Cepheus thing, which uh, and more on the investment side. Um, certainly, we're seeing. I'm seeing sort of. Chinese investors uh, investing in early, early stage companies, either the companies doesn't, doesn't want them, um, but often the company beggars can't be choosers. Uh, but mm -hmm. so, so I think if it was offered, they'd probably still take it. But I, I'm seeing that uh, Chinese um, funds uh, often have difficulty getting money out of money China out. Mm -hmm. and um, investing. Uh, I think on the other dynamic, though, we've, the collaboration obviously has increased. So you can have a Zoom call with a customer anywhere. It doesn't really matter whether the person's next door or whether they're 10,000 miles away. And that dynamic, the cultural dynamic, the whole world uh, is achieving. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot more uh, dynamism there, which I think is leading to more interaction, more business. So again, you can have as many laws as you want, but you can't stop people talking to each other mm -hmm. if the technology's there. Um, right, to enable that. And we're cl clearly in prime time, it's the one time in history, the whole world is, has got getting the same experience. Uh, some of them are negative, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. But the, on the positive side, we're now, you think nothing of it, right? Just to, to get on a Zoom call uh, on, 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 with, with one person. I think there was an article, there was a commentary a few years ago, and as we play out 30 years from now, um, you know, if we knew that we could have free, high-quality video calls with Australia for free, would we be building, um, you know, aeroplanes and things <laughs> like that? Right, that's to play that 30 years from now. We, you know, maybe we're going to have holodeck meetings, and we doesn't really, we don't, you know, maybe the infrastructure investments we should be putting more in, in, in different uh, technologies instead. So I think things can change the. Um, yeah, behavior. I mean, if you look at Star Trek, Star Wars, yes, the holograms exist, but people still go there in their <laughs> respective <laughs> yeah. uh, that was, right? Of course, that's science fiction, uh, Swadley. So. Oh, wow. I feel like science fiction does lead to science reality. It does, you know? it does. <laughs> Um, so, Ben, I do have this uh, question for you. What do you think is the impact of global trade? Um, for Specifically for your area and as you think about funding and startups in deep tech? Yeah, sure. So I, I guess um, if I could answer like a slightly, slightly different question, um, you know, I think I, I don't think I have anything to add in terms of the kind of, you know, uh, equity fundraising at that stage of Series A and beyond, you know, Jamie and Rajan obviously have more perspective on that. I do think that, um, you know, you do see impacts at the closer to the company formation stage um, that are that are not necessarily about global trade, but they're kind of more broadly around just the, you know, the broader geopolitics. A lot of that yeah. filters through immigration uh, restrictions. I think you know, you know, um, Jimmy had mentioned, you know, about typically the most common people who who find who found these deep technology companies um, who run them, and most of the time then run them to the to the resolution one way or the other. They're mostly kind of recent, uh, oftentimes recent advanced degree holders in science and technology. And in American universities, that's about half foreign born. Um, there's, there's data on that you can obviously look up. And so, um, for example, our program, you know, the, the SBR program requires that these be American small businesses, meaning that the people control them and run them are either citizens or permanent residents. So the way that that uh, works out is that, you know, there's, there's, you know, once you get your PhD, there's not necessarily a guarantee um, that you can obtain that status. And obviously, in many cases, that's when there's a natural time to start the company. And uh, so that's one thing. So that that sometimes uh, creates impediments. And obviously, the, the to your to your question, the more the kind of geopolitics, um, you know, the, the international relations piece moves relative to how strict the immigration things are, the more that will impact startup formation. You know, the, the harder it is to stay in this country as a, as, a, as a foreign national to become, to get a green card, all those things that will impact the startup formation. Um, so that's one piece. And then, um, you know, I think the other piece is that uh, we haven't talked about COVID at all, which is mm -hmm. refreshing, actually. You know, it's something that seems like it's the it's the focus of every discussion. But mm, that's um, for our next panel. But oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Well, that'll be after the election, and I won't have to be asked to speculate anymore. So, um, no. But the other thing is that I think um, 
uh, when these kind of broader winds uh, make things feel less secure, you know, when there's a downturn like COVID. And there's, there's actually a paper that came out on this. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's basically that um, people who don't have the ability to, who are not permanent residents, who don't necessarily have the ability to to stay in the country, um, feel a fl feel like the pull to, f to flee to safety, which tends to still be psychologically a big company rather than a startup, even though, as we know, big companies are not necessarily any more secure in terms of job security um, than startups, but I think there's still a perception there. So I think the way that we see these things play out, the kind of broader political climate is just in the in the amount of security that people are seeking and the, the immigration um, effects on company formation. So, so that's actually very interesting because, um, you know, at the start of this section of discussion about specific policies, we highlighted three key policies that we wanted to discuss, which is tax policy, funding for fundamental research, and then the international relations. And what our panelists seem to be agreeing is that tax policy does not really impact that much because you have a long-term view. Um, and funding for fundamental research also has not changed because it is congressionally mandated. So what does impact is this whole idea of international relations and this immigration debate, um, and that has impacted startup formation and uh, you know survival, I would say, negatively. We have certainly felt it uh, at Propelex as well. So uh, that's that's kind of interesting. Finally, where will you invest, right? I think that's a very important topic before I get to the audience questions, although I'm keep keeping a a, a, one eye on that. Uh, but uh, what are your favorite deep tech sectors? So uh, Ben, I do want to start with you because you see the earliest, uh, you know, and I don't know if you'll see a difference due to the, uh, due to the, the different uh, administrations or if it is just kind of the circumstances or the times that we're in. But do you think you, you see a change, uh, whether it's energy and green technologies, you know, healthcare, life sciences, software, aerospace, transportation, what have you, the various deep tech sectors, what's your view? Yeah, so I mean, the, I think you had two questions. I mean, to, to the extent that um, we make investments, I think we're, um, the way that we think about that is pretty insulated from kind of the near-term election results. Mm -hmm. I think in, in the government, um, as you all know, you hear about certain agencies in the news more than others. Some agencies are more in the political um, spin cycle. Um, mm -hmm. I think the closer you get to fundamental research and the closer you get to kind of an economic development program like small like SBIR, mm -hmm. I think the more that we're given, um, you know, we have the ability to kind of um, to chart a chart our own path. There's not as much of a, you know, politicians. I don't think necessarily. Um, I think they understand that basic research is is a special kind of thing, and and as you know, the peer review process is what's typically used there, and in, in general. Um, it's, it's more or less uh, basic research is supposed to be blue sky and not driven by the local whims. And I think mm -hmm. in general, I think that's, that's been the, my experience. It's been, we've been quite able to, when NSF uses the term investigator driven, which is to say, you know, that the scientists, um, tell us the idea that they are the ones who are supposed to come up with it. It's supposed to come bottom up rather than top down. And I think in general, that's true for basic research and for, for the SBR program. And um, there's a question in our, from our audience has, mm -hmm. The pandemic affected the kind of uh, investments that you're attracted mm -hmm. to that NSF is investing in. Yeah, so I mean, the, the general answer to that question, to, to the question you had asked as well, Swati, about what, what are we going to do after the election? The answer, even if I, you know, felt like I could talk about it and predict who's going to win the election, is that we view one of our one of our kind of value propositions as a as a program is that we're not trying to pick pick sectors. The mm -hmm. idea is that we serve the taxpayer, and so therefore. We're going to try to cast as wide a net as possible and get as many great uh, entrepreneurs into the process. So, as you know, we have a, a technology topic range as broad as PropelX, you know, with very, very broad technology topics because, um, because you know, our job isn't to maximize the IRR, the return to our investors. The job is to, you know, help economic competitiveness, and that's across every every sector. Um, oh. So, in, in terms of that, and so the question you asked about about. COVID, you know, I think because of COVID, because the government, you know, it was such an unprecedented crisis, we did have a special, we'd have a kind of a, a, a brief time where we had an expedited process to try to get solutions for COVID, you know, to try to fund them and get them out into the world. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily what um, non-dilutive funding is supposed to do. I mean, it's still pretty early stage technology. And so 
the, the chance that it actually scales within the time period that COVID, hopefully COVID won't last 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously uh, some, that's a little harder for us to do, but the, the goal is to try to just try to help people who are working in that area to try to develop new things, right? So we funded, um, we had this call, we got a lot of interest in it. We, we funded things from new disinfection technologies to new diagnostics and new mm -hmm. therapeutics across the board. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in general, it's sort of kind of a national crisis like that. We try to stay out of the game of dictating uh, what topics we're more interested in than others. Got it. Thank you. Um, so Jamie, does, um, does the election outcome impact what kinds of startups you would invest in or become, you expect to become more prominent uh, going forward? I don't think it has a, uh, the outcome itself for the election specifically does not have an impact. Um, but I think that there are certainly areas like not speaking for us, but just from a macro standpoint mm -hmm. that will attract more investment. Um, you know, I think clean tech is yes. one that mm -hmm. is very likely, um, you know, specifically because of politics. And, and, you know, I would say it's politics, but it's also just combined with the economics of that industry of material improved since the first wave of clean tech, what now, 10 or 15 years ago mm -hmm. um, with uh, solar uh, and other, uh, uh, other fuels being price competitive. Um, and so I, I think that will certainly be the case. I think um, you know, healthcare and life sciences are likely to, and it, that, that may not be a, uh, a political uh, impetus for that improving, but just now, I mean, you, I, think, I think you said it before, the entire world is focused on one problem right now being COVID. Um, and, you know, so I think that there's likely to be a lot more investment in that area, um, not specific to COVID, but just, uh, you know, just generally. Um, and I think that, that trend was already playing out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yes, I, I think that there are other sectors, different sectors will benefit in different ways in the near term based on an election. Um, but I think the trends, the longer term trends, as I mentioned before, are the ones that we're most, most focused on. Um, so the outcome of the election will not have an impact of how we think about, you know, the world 10 years from now. But co does Code 2, uh, specific to Code 2, do you invest in uh, sectors like clean tech or, you know, medical devices, life sciences, that kind of thing, healthcare? We, we do. We're not specifically, so we, we invest in, you know, our, our term is ESG. We do it mostly at the growth stage, not necessarily at the incubation stage, mm -hmm. seed stage or series right. A stage. So right. I want to make that distinction clear. Right. Um, and we're not specifically a biotech or life sciences investor, yeah. but we do invest in and around business models that are in healthcare, health tech, et cetera. Got so um, those are obviously you know, very large areas, important areas for us, um, but we're not, um, you know, I wouldn't, I would never compare ourselves to, you know, investing in fundamental research in the deep tech area. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So, so Ranjan, coming to you, you know, the, the really interesting thing about our panel is that Ben, uh, who's at the SBIR and SF, represents like the pre, pre, pre seed stage. You do more the angel and early stage. And then I think Jamie does, uh, you know, series A's and ons. Um, what do you think will be the impact of the election? What do you expect to see? What sectors, specific sectors? Right, I think your original question is what's going to happen after November the 3rd as opposed to the election driver. Yes, yes, uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm probably closer to Ben. Uh, Ben's uh, sort of types of companies often first check, uh, often would do checks before SBIR <laughs> kicks in, <laughs> get in before that SF gets in. Um, and so certainly my own companies have been in that area. But I'm, so I'm voting with my feet. Uh, there's this macro trend of biology beginning to turn into an engineering subject, you know, we, with the preponderance of data and uh, uh, machine learning techniques where uh, historically biology has been a trial and error kind of area uh, and a, really a, a bet where you have to have diversification. I think uh, we're now in the next 10, 20 years uh, uh, be able to try and uh, make drugs at a more rapid rate and uh, a cheaper rate. And that's probably not factored into the $30 trillion budget for Medicare for all, that you know, technology will improve and lower these costs uh, for healthcare. So healthcare, but specifically, specifically engineering and, um, and data science for healthcare projects. The second point is um, longevity. We're all going to start living uh -huh. longer. Yeah. Um, well, you know, basically, uh, you know, 60 is the new 40, and uh, 
you know, 80 is the new 60, and uh, and people will be living to their late 90s. There's a conditional probability that you've got to got to uh, my age, then there's a good chance you're going to live a long while. And so 10,000 people every day are hitting the age of 65, and that's going to generate lots of more needs, uh, not just at the uh, science level, but probably at the societal level uh, for uh, for education, for example. Uh, people want to change careers, and that will lend itself to um, uh, online learning and uh, uh, products that people will need in their 80s and 90s. Uh, you know, so longevity is a key area that, uh, that I'm looking at. And, uh, and the other third area is artificial intelligence. Um, I've been working on it for like 35 years at this point. Uh, so it's not like a six year, 10 year, people think it's six years old. Um, but uh, that'll probably be another 35 years when we get our holodex from Star Trek. I mean, we're really still not at Star Trek levels, even for speech recognition. Yes. Uh, we're still, people think we've cracked it and we haven't cracked it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we definitely have not cracked it. I think it's a solved problem, uh, but we're nowhere near science fiction levels. So uh, I think there's lots of things that haven't scratched the surface uh, yet. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I guess people won't stop turning 65 just because there's a change in administration. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that that macro trend is not going to change. So so that's that's interesting because what Ben is saying, we cast a wide net and across technologies anyway. And Jamie and Ronjan are looking at these macro trends, which um, really supersede whatever any administrations or elections and so on. So it's, it's not that that is going to change. Um, so I find that interesting. Nothing is going to change <laughs> in investing. I suspect uh, my personal view is I think if the Biden administration comes to the fore, it's possible that clean tech uh, has a resurgence. Uh, but it will depend on the tax credits because I think it needs a, a, a lot of support. So um, uh, let's let's take a quick look at some of the audience questions, and I'm not sure I'm doing the best job on my screen sharing, but um, so there is this question about immigration, which I think we did address, right? That uh, uh, we think it does matter. Um, are there any technology areas that would not do as well under one administration versus the other? I would say that the, you know I think the immediate term um, would look at regulation, and so I think there's been a lot of you know should we break up big tech, and so I think that is administration dependent mm-hmm. uh, for sure. And so if there's going to be a movement there towards more regulation um, and you know a, a breakup for the the larger internet companies specifically, it won't happen under the current administration. It is likely to gain traction, at least, you know, at the formative stages and the, you know, the talking point stages mm-hmm. quite early on in the new administration. So I think that's one area that, you know, we may see that, um, you know, post, uh, I guess, January. Mm. Well, assuming there is a change. Assuming there's a change, correct, right. So well, I would yeah. expect a status quo with no change and, uh, I would expect that if there is going to be a change, it would be under a different administration. Got it. Got it. I think that might help startup. Big tech is not okay. necessarily yes. good for startup. I don't think it's particularly, yep. you know, the commoditized segment, give stuff away for free, so no one can invest in in, in certain areas. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I, did, I didn't mean to come off that that was a negative for the, for the landscape, but, but, but a change. Um, you know, I think it's just, it, it's fairly amazing if you saw Apple's earnings yesterday at $20 billion in R&D. Uh, was yes. kind of, it, it's kind of unfathomable, but it's also, you know, you, we talked a lot about um, uh, spending in fundamental research versus mm-hmm. product research or company-led research. And, you know, I think the tax changes, tax regimes, higher taxes will impact that. So there's a little bit, like a little bit more incentive to grow equity value versus um, uh, mm. versus not. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think you're right, Ron John. It will, I, I think a lot of areas are uninvestable um, specifically because of the threat of uh, large incumbents. Ron do you want to expand on that thought? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, you know, the example I usually give is like, I'm, probably people can't remember, there used to be an app called Grammatic 
Uh, it used to run on MS-DOS, and it was a great grammar-checking software. And uh, then Microsoft just gave it for free, uh, you know, for half version of it, kind of. The, um, and then it stopped grammar-checking technology for like 30 years because there's no money to be made in it. And only recently we've got Grammarly Grammar. now that's <laughs> popped <Yeah>. up <laughs> last yeah. few years. So it, it's... Uh, it, 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 on the other hand, big tech is a major acquirer of um, of many companies and uh, a major customer. Uh, they can't do everything. Uh, so I think that is an area that government should get a bit more sophisticated on. It's not a simple just let's to break them up. It's not as simple mm -hmm. as that. Exactly. Uh, it, it, but, uh, but I think there's many, many uh, nuances. I think um, no, maybe... You know, maybe there might be more uh, investment in uh, uh, in uh, sort of gov tech, maybe under under sort of a sort of a, a sort of a government spending kind of mm -hmm. administration, which is usually a more of a democratic kind of thing, building up infrastructure. Um, and um, yeah, we've probably ne so that you know, versus positive versus negative. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll stop, I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> ben, do you have an opinion? Is are you investing in GovTech? I mean, I, our um, our our program has no specific um, <laughs> pro or against GovTech, right? So the idea is that our companies are, are are we encourage them to go find the market that they think is best. And we try not to put our finger on that scale because yeah. most of the economies in the private sector, most of our companies then do go after private markets. Just the, the size of the overall you know, aggregate market is larger. Some of our, some of our folks do end up with the government as a primary customer. Uh, although some of those, if they really know who it is, it, it makes less sense because we're not a customer, you know, we're a funding agency, which is, mm. which is actually a blessing for us because we don't have any back office where they need a particular technology because that allows us to kind of maintain this kind of, you know, investigator driven, fairly topic agnostic approach. Um, so yeah, the goal, the goal is to give that freedom back to the entrepreneur um, because, uh, the greatest entrepreneurs are only going to apply if they feel like we can support their vision versus vice versa. There's a question directed specifically at you. What are the current focus areas for SBIR that have received additional funding or attention recently? You know, AI, cybersecurity. So again, we're um, the NSF, we're about uh, seven or eight percent of the overall SBIR pie. So um, the overall SBIR um, program, I would not apply to this answer to, but at the NSF, um, again, we our funding just scales with the interest, right? Because we're trying to be somewhat agnostic. So uh, Ron John mentioned, you know, and I'm sure it's no surprise to him that over the last few years, the number of folks applying for AI, AI to us has gone up by two or three or four times. Nanotechnology, that happened in the mid aughts. Then we had, you know, synthetic biology, right? So all these things happen as a result of kind of the broader trends. And, and as the number of proposals goes up, our funding goes up, but not because we're trying to focus that area, but because we're, you know, we get more, core companies who are doing things and it turns out, you know, more, more applications means more good uh, opportunities for us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think outside the NSF, um, you could probably, you know, every other agency mostly does give you a very good sense about what they're interested in. And mm -hmm. um, cybersecurity and AI are absolutely part, parts of them, um, but it really depends on the agency, right? So the Department of Energy, uh, you can imagine, you know, they're obviously really big into clean energy. They do, they do all kinds of energy, but obviously, since that's their mandate, that's a big focus for them. Um, the Department of Defense is mostly interested in technologies that serve the warfighter, so there's some technologies that are more into that area than others. Um, but I think, um, I think, you know, most of them are pretty, um, pretty intuitive when you understand what the agency is trying to do. Got it. Um, there's an interesting question, which is, um, how do or what? What about differences in privacy law, especially with regards to California, EU, GDPR, and China? Uh, do you think that would, I mean, do you think regulation would change either way to impact these areas? Or do you think we'd have more you know, support or more activity in any of these areas? It certainly has made it more complex uh, for many startups, uh, GDPR. Well, I think in the US, we basically follow Europe. <laughs> Um, uh, One decade uh, later, <laughs> yeah, kind of. It basically, is a, is a model because mm -hmm. I think Euro European countries are more sensitive to it. Certain countries are really sensitive to it because of the uh, of the Second World War um, uh, issues a long time ago. Uh, China, I think, 
at least perception wise is that it's uh, you know it competes on a business moat rather than other other dimensions uh so the the trade-off here is you know in an ai system which relies on data mm -hmm. uh so are you going to choose a product that theoretically may work better because you just have more data because you don't pay as much attention to privacy which is you know if you're in a country like china maybe you just physically get more data because of those things or are you going to choose a product that's more trustworthy mm. right which is in europe you may not have as much data but it, you trust it more and you're going to have that tension uh go, going forward so it's not necessarily a bad thing that um you have less uh less data my prediction is china will probably follow follow uh, global standards as well because uh They'll need their products to be trustworthy as well to get to access global market. So eventually it'll stabilize. But you've got Europe, I think, that's leading, leading, leading the way right now. Understood. So um, there is a question. Uh, I mean, so there are questions coming in about Grammarly now that we spoke about. The thing is, <laughs> you know, I don't think we can. Uh, we're almost at the end of our time, right? So I'm, I'm really sorry, Ashish. We'll, we'll try to answer that another time but there is i just want to wrap up with one question which i thought was interesting um what do you wish i had asked you in the context of this which i did not uh what what, what company would you invest in right now okay please tell me what <laughs> well i'm not actually i'm not even not... sure by regulation i can <laughs> ask you <laughs> exactly you can't you can't you comply it's not so well, let... Well, I am that. <laughs> well, uh, or at least have an investment strategy, I guess. So it's sort of like, um, yes. yeah, what would you invest in right now? So, uh, yeah, I told you, I'm doing biotech, um, machine learning, biotech combination, that intersection. Okay. Jamie, what do you wish I had asked that I did not? Uh, you know, I think one interesting area, um, if we were to if we were to get into it, and it's a you know, if we need if we had another twenty minutes, it's you know, I think there's a bifurcation between different sectors. So you, when you put the business sentiment up, you know, if you overlay the business sentiment in the restaurant sector, hospitality sector, travel sector, etc., I mean, I think there's very strong um, business sentiment in the areas that we all traffic in, which is most relevant. But I also think it's part of the overall debate when you're talking about policy changes at the very highest level. They're not just thinking about tech. Uh, they're not just thinking about areas that, that we obviously spend all of our days in and care about a lot, but I think that's certainly part of the conversation. So it's a long conversation. You could probably do an entire panel on it, but, um, but that, that's one area that I think I find interesting um, that sits alongside this, this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Ben, what do you think, uh, what do you wish I had asked which I did not? Um, I, I wish you could just ha have you ask questions to Ranjan and Jamie for the next couple of hours so I can <laughs> learn more about how to get our companies uh, in position so they can get funded down the line. So yeah, that, that's my interest. <laughs> so maybe we can do that offline. But no, I, th I, I think um, I think that, uh, you know, we're so focused on the this early stage of a company where the macro stuff is not um, is maybe not as um, front and center. And so it's great to actually zoom out a little bit and get hear from people who are thinking about that. So I, I think all the questions are really helpful and informative for me. There's nothing that I have on my chest that I'm dying to get out, but everyone can go to our, our website if they want to know more, uh, seedfund.nsf.gov. Thank you so much, uh, Ronjon, Jamie, Ben. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for your questions. One last thing to wrap up, we did uh, talk about COVID very briefly. So our next panel, upcoming panel, discusses the path to the COVID-19 vaccine that is on December 11th. It's moderated by our longtime friend and partner at Breakout Labs, Hemi Parthasarthi. She has a really excellent panel of three uh, panelists coming up. So if you want to register for that, please go to propellex.com slash events. Uh, thank you again. And this was an excellent panel. Thank you once again to the panelists. Thank, thank you. you, Swati. Thanks, Great guys. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.